going to try and do something here tonight that I've never done before, which is to read a little bit from a couple of different things. Um, but I think it's, it's an important conversation for me to have about writing across genres because I think that, for me, um, content demands form. For me, sort of what it is that I want to write about, in the same way that if you write poems, some poems want to be long and skinny, and some poems want to be big and fat, and some poems want to be prose, and some poems want to rhyme. And you sort of have to, it's your job to figure out what's going to fit your, what it is that you're writing about. And for me, that's just become expansive and, and sort of, I find myself trying to do a little bit of everything now. And it, it poses its own problems. But so what I'm going to try and do is read some things. And, and it'll be interesting to see if people can sort of hear whatever the voice is that runs through them all. Um, but yes, these are, I, I once did a children's, now that I write for children, I get to do these events where I go visit elementary schools and libraries and things. And I go, you know, to read to seven, to, to like say seven year olds from this book. And I get there and they have all my books displayed. But this book has naughty words in it. And so then I have to go and tell the librarian like, no, 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 you can't have that book in your library. <laughs> so. But I do think that I'm writing about the same kinds of things over and over again. And sometimes something will start in one genre and end up in another. So I'll start working on what I think is the outline for a new novel, and that'll end up being an essay. Or I'll start writing a prose poem, and that'll turn into a picture book. So it, it sort of it finds its way. So these are poems, and then we'll move to prose. <clears throat> this, is a, this book starts with a series of poems about a character called The Girl, and then moves through some more personal poetry and into prose. The field has a girl. The sky has a blackbird. The field has a girl. The sky is to the field as the field is to the sky, only backwards. White is to the blackbird as fear is to the girl, despite she's small and alone. The bird has a wing in the wind, a face in the sky, and a shadow on the girl. There's a boy in the field, too, and the girl says she'd like to hold the blackbird, but free isn't the same as clean, said the boy, or safe. And anyway, the blackbird doesn't want to be held. The bird beats its wings. The girl waits. The sky creaks. The girl says, I live in this world, and means it. But still, she is small in the field and beneath the sky and the path of the blackbird. I live in this, says the girl. Alone, says the girl. Things become quieter. Things become. No matter what you do with your life, says the girl. Can you guys hear me in the back? Are you okay? Barely. Barely. I'll, I'll try. I'll try and speak up. <clears throat> the girl learns forfeit. You know what? I can actually. Can you move? If I move, I can push forward. <laughs> the girl learns forfeit. One. The girl's sure that the silt in her tea is ground glass, and she thinks she'll die soon. She wants to tell the boy, but they're playing chess, and it's his turn. So she gropes at her belly instead. The girl's sure she's bleeding on the inside. She lets go her teacup, but the cup lands upright on the table. So everything's fine, and it's easy to keep going. The girl has considered slitting her throat, but she's afraid of intention. She wants an accident, but she's never had one. Somehow, the girl just never walks when it's time to stand still and so walking can't kill her. Like the magic of how she was born breathing, a simpler version of thought, but with her breath and some air. She doesn't try. She doesn't try. She's sure things fall from the sky because it's the easiest place to fall from. The girl thinks even the sky is falling heavily from the sky, though somehow she's not beneath it when it falls. Some people call this luck, but the girl knows better. She's a fish who can live on a plate. Now the girl tosses the game into the air, so the air is falling around her, raining little men and men on horses who knock the teacup over, so the game is ruined, but never finished. What else could I do, asks the girl. The answer to the puzzle. The answer to the puzzle is the mauled bird on the sidewalk and the feathers. The answer to the puzzle is that things keep getting less lovely, but more interesting. When the girl falls through the air from the top of a very tall building, she sees everything rush past in great detail, but with very little promise. Onlookers see, 
Some girl cutting through the air like a knife cuts through water. They gasp and say, how terrible. That poor girl, it's just awful. And it really is a moment. There's people outside. Are there seats? There are some seats up here. Yeah, there are seats up here. <clears throat> now I'll squish back. Sorry. Now I'll squish back a little. Okay. So to catch you guys up, there's this weird girl and she keeps dying. <laughs> Happily ever after. The wolf bears down on the girl, thin in the corner. His teeth are as sharp as the shoulder blades beneath them. Everyone's hungry. The wolf heaves and moans. His ribs shift beneath his pelt. He gnashes and drools, chews through his words, just where I want you. She's small, a house of straw, of twigs, of air. She's a sheep in sheep's clothing. She whispers sadly, just where I want you. It's always the girl, really. In every doorway behind each tree, she's paddling down river on a raft, she's licking the batter from the spoon, pumping your gas. Thank you, ma'am. She's every wolf, every rib, every snarl, no matter how she tells her story, no matter what the frame looks like. The curtains blow strangely, the windows wide open, but that doesn't mean she went through it. The wolf's full, this room is empty. But where's our clever girl? She's over there behind that door. So that's the first section of the book. And, and then it sort of moves into more personal poetry. But I think, I think what I'm, the thing that runs through all of these is that I try and think of ways to do storytelling that are a little bit different. I would say if I have a goal through all of my work, that's it. That I'm not somebody who's not interested in the story but I'm also not somebody who wants to tell a story the way you've heard it every time. And I don't know if I always achieve that. I don't know if I always get there, but that's sort of what I'm always trying to do. So this is a different story. The truth. Listen. My grandmother died and we burned her up in a fire. But when we went to dump the ashes in water, because water is cool and makes us feel better, she refused to be put under. She floated until my uncle held her down. He forced her to swallow the end and the water to swallow her body. And then we drove away quick, didn't stare too long at the spot. She was horrible, my grandmother. And that's the truth, though my uncle pretended. She was a good old girl, just the dog done lost her bite. But no. No, she never did, we told him. If only she had. The witch. There she was, rising, biting at us from her very end, trying to claw her way to beyond her welcome, which died about the time she began. It's a terrible thing, hatred of family, the dead, water that is not heavy enough to pull things down and keep them. I love you, I said to her as she died. Yes, but you love lots of people, she growled back faintly. Not enough, I should have told her then. Nowhere near. Okay, so then I'm going to read... <coughs> from the third section of the book, which sort of leaves the girl and then leaves me and goes to other places. And this is one of those places, but also is a story. In the kitchen. God clacks his spoon against his bowl, his bowl against his table, and his table against the white walls of his house. God's impatient, or just, keeping time. The soup isn't hot enough yet, so he waits, writes his name on a yellowing cookbook where the dust is thick and moist. He writes, God. God's a sloppy housewife. He sits on the counter, stares at his slippers, watches the pot of soup until it boils on the stove. It smells like cabbage and turns the day into what God calls supper. God reaches for the salt and thinks about his dreams, how they're full of other people, other things. God tears into the bread and it feels nice, close against his fingers. He finds his teacup cracked and whimpers. He can fix it, but it will still have been broken. God pulls the teacup to his belly and holds it there hard. He says to the room, look, something might happen. 
And so then I'm going to read one long poem from the end of the book, which at the end, as I, as I was writing this book, at the end of the book I began to start writing prose. And I, I, in my head they were still poems. Um, but I think what I was starting to figure out was that if I would let myself go and tell a story, that I would sort of, I would, I would find it easier to just pay attention to language. So this is sort of the end of the book. Night five, the bake sale. It's a series of dreams. It was cold in my town, in the town where I live. Lucy and I were sad, walking beside each other in the cold, not speaking. I wanted her to cry, to finish with tears, but she wouldn't. The silence was buzzing, a fly trapped in a car. The silence of Lucy not speaking was something being torn too slowly, a piece of thick paper ripping for a year. Finally, she walked away. Alone, I looked at the sidewalk, counted the cracks, and felt warm. It's only that I'm walking fast, I told myself, but I took off my mittens and my hat, let them fall behind me. I shed my scarf the same way, walking faster. I slipped out of my coat as I felt one boot come unglued, stick in the mud, so I kicked the other boot, let go. I was down to my jeans and a little white blouse. My socks were gone and my feet were moving fast. My legs flashed like seconds and my hair shook itself loose and still I was warm. And I thought a flushed thought, thought a laugh and stopped. I stopped to swallow my thought and it was spring. The trees were somewhere green and wet and the sun was warm over the cool breeze and hot on the sidewalk. I was at an intersection, a familiar corner. I stopped slowly east, noticing things. <laughs> And when I came to a sign, I stopped. It said, bake sale. I was supposed to meet you. I was supposed to meet you at the bake sale. I was five minutes late, and so I ran inside. And the woman said in a hushed voice, oh, he's out back, dear, through this door into the garden. I went into the garden. There were peonies and morning glories, lilacs and daffodils. The garden was a bower, and the bower was for sale. Tables covered in icing, covered in blossoms, sprinkled with sugar and sifted. You were there waiting. I reached for a cake grabbed for something to give you, and what my fingers found was the smallest cake of all. It was the size of a hand, a little flat circle covered in hard sugar, filled with smaller circles, filled with even smaller circles than that. And inside each of the smallest circles were letters I could barely read. I looked close, looked hard. I stepped toward you with the little cake, and you said, look again. I know, I know, I said. Each tiny circle had the smallest letters I had ever seen, written in the finest hand, as though etched, carved with an invisible pin, words again and again, over and over and over. They said, I am happy, I am happy, I am happy, in sugar. So that's poetry. <coughs> and then I took this, I had this prose poem that was part of that original series that was called, um, originally it was called Fault, about a house that burned down. And I was working on it, and I was working on it, and I was working on it, and somehow that turned into this. And, uh, and so I took the prose poem and I like chopped it up into all these lines and suddenly it turned into a picture book about this diner where I used to work. Um, so this is a semi-autobiographical <laughs> poem turned picture book called Inside the Slidey Diner. And I guess I should do the... <clears throat> I've never done this at a poetry reading before. <laughs> this is Edie. Inside the Slidey Diner is where I spend my... Di well, Inside the slidey diner is where I spend my days because once I stole a lemon drop from the box behind the counter and got caught. Ethel May sees everything. Inside the slidey diner, the greasy spoon of stuck, there's a gray man at the counter who mumbles and smells like mice. He orders oatmeal, but he never eats it. He only falls asleep in his bowl. Inside the slidey diner, everyone shouts and coughs. Clatter and din, hullabaloo. Inside the slidey diner, the noise is always. But there's no music. Inside the slidey diner, the floors all slant and the tables tilt. When a sticky bun rolls onto the floor, Ethel May sweeps it up and serves it again to you. <laughs> the walls used to be the color of your grandma's slippers until Ethel May painted them moldy with black trim. Ethel May wears a hairnet to keep the sticks and pins from falling into the fryer. She smells like rotten grill grease. When she scratches her back with the spatula, flies stick to her sweater. Sometimes Ethel May grins at you and you can see her tooth. <laughs> she laughs, but never in a nice way. If she gives you a piece of pie, it's pumpkin asparagus with crunchy bit topping. Nobody will tell you what the crunchy bits are. 
You should try the house specialty, lumps and dumplings. There's a secret ingredient, so shh. The greasily niblets are okay, too, but stay away from the lady fingers. They really are. <laughs> the coffee will give you hives, terrible hives. Inside the slidey diner, someone is usually running with scissors. There are slipping butter puddles wherever you step, so be careful. Nobody will also help you up when you fall. Last Tuesday, it got so greasy, the booth slid right out into the street, and the people just kept on eating. They were never heard from again. It's true. I was in the back room peeling eyes from the potatoes, but my teacher's son, Fred, said his cousin saw it happen. Inside the slidey diner, the waitresses all look pretty, but they aren't. They're only cranky ants wearing masks, and they'll pinch you hard. The chocolate milk isn't really chocolate. My mother said that before my time at the slidey diner, there were gigantic ginger cookies here, but the cookies got smaller and smaller and smaller, and the same thing might happen to you. If you need to use the bathroom at the slidey diner, hold it, because the bathroom is deep underground below the cellar at the bottom of a spindly staircase, and you have to wade through a sea of spiky nosed wattle beetles and nefarious wiggle peas to get there, and then the flush doesn't work. But if you ignore the mice and mumble man and you skip the lady fingers, if you avoid Ethel May and you slide past the cranky ants, if you watch your step and you aren't afraid of wiggle peds, if you cover your ears and hold your nose and breathe deeply, then it's not so bad. It's really not so bad because inside the slidey diner there are dark blue secrets and silver whispers. Inside the slidey diner there are magic trap doors to birthdays and Saturday. Inside the slidey diner Goodbyes have been banned. And the little boy leaves. So, wouldn't you like a lemon drop? Wouldn't you just love a lemon drop? Have one. They're delicious. I won't tell a soul. So that's a picture book. <laughs> Thank you. But I hope, I mean, I hope that the goal of this is not just to read you picture books. The goal of this is to, sh to show somehow, it's nice to have an opportunity to do this, that the same care and language and play and sort of changes in syntax that go into poetry go into other things. It's just that somebody tells you what it is. Somebody says, this is a poem. This is a book for children. This is an essay. This is a novel. And, and really, it is the same work. So <clears throat> then after that had all happened, and I, had sort of, I started working on this next, and I didn't tell anybody. I was embarrassed. I didn't want anybody to know I was writing books for children. Then I started writing another story, and uh, it kept getting longer and longer and longer and finally I realized I had started writing a children's novel and that I had to start chopping it into chapters and, um, and that was about eight years ago and it took a really long time to sort of get this out into the world and now this is becoming part, a big part of what I do but I'm just going to read you a little bit of the first chapter this is called Up and Down the Scratchy Mountains and it's a sort of fairy tale <clears throat> Before the Beginning Began our story doesn't begin once upon a time or back in the days of yore. It didn't happen as long ago as all that. But still it happened before televisions and interstate highways and even before your grandma was a little girl. Back then, the world was a different place. Nowadays, people can visit anywhere they please because of silver airplanes and big ocean liners. Nowadays, people can go to France or Zimbabwe, Topeka or Kathmandu and be home in time for dinner. But back when this story began, the world had tiny corners pockets nobody ever visited because it was too hard to get there. In one such corner of the world, beyond two continents and across a wide ocean, nowhere near France or Topeka, there was a corner of the world that was chock full of rolling hills and jagged mountains, rivers and streams and walled villages. And in that land, which was called the Bewilderness, there was a village called Thistle. And just inside the village walls of Thistle, there was a blue barn, and beside the barn, close enough that the red and white cows sometimes munched on the window box geraniums, there was a tiny house. It was a stone house, a white one with a thatched roof and a smokestack that chuffed cheerfully. In the house, there was a family that consisted of a papa, a mama, and two little girls named Sally and Lucy. The family was happy almost all the time, which is as happy as anyone can expect to be. Sally was only two years old, but she was helpful, quiet and well-behaved. Her brown hair hung straight and never mussed, and somehow her shoes stayed remarkably clean. Everything about Sally was clean. In fact, her very favorite game of all was helping Mama fold the dish towels, which is unusual for a child. Sally was good. Lucy was not. She was a tiny baby, fresh and bright and snappy, with a peach glow and a head of rosy curls, but she screamed all the time. 
She screamed when she was being put to sleep and when she was waking up, and sometimes she even screamed when she was snoring. She screamed when she was eating mashed peas so that the peas fell out of her mouth in a blurp. She screamed when her papa chucked her under the chin and when he left in the morning to milk the cows. And she screamed loudest whenever Sally tried to hold her because Sally's arms were too small. So sometimes Lucy slid free and landed on the floor with a funk. In fact, the only time that Lucy didn't scream was when her mama held her in the rocker and sang to her softly. Since nobody liked to hear Lucy scream, her mama sang to her most of the day and often at night. She sang every song she knew and some she didn't really know. When she ran out of songs to sing, she made up tunes of her own and sang the words from the cookbook. And I'm going to, well, I'll sing the song and then I'll close with that. <clears throat> I don't sing very well. Oh, take two cups of sugar and put them in a pot. Then add a bunch of raisins and stir it up a lot. When it gets to bubbling, chop an apple in. And now I can't remember where I put my rolling pin. <laughs> so that's a novel. <laughs> and uh, I think we're coming up on. I'm going to close with one last poem because I want to come bring back to poetry. Um, but as I said, I'm all about storytelling. This is an, one of the poems from the beginning of the book. What the Doc Saw. One, the moon shone on the bottle girl inside. At rest it was resting. It was still where the girl slept, cheek to glass, hushed. She was done with water, but first the water had done with her, nearly finished her with a clever wave. And how the bottle escaped the wave was a miracle of division. It was a strong bottle. The girl was fine if held. They were two vessels. So if a gull, white rustling in darkness, found himself less white in that darkness, less lit from above, he could hardly blame the moon its grudging love. The gull cried hollow, outside the moment. The girl slept on. The bottle was full. The moon felt sad, but when he turned to them, he turned on them. The girl turned in her sleep, and the bottle shivered. Two, the girl crawled out and into mourning. All pale and simple, she found herself with sand on scrambling knees, water, held by waterline, now inching an apology. Bottle, empty object, moon gone. Instead, the sun, a sure sun, and almost where she looked, almost everywhere. Thanks. And questions. Happy to answer anything about anything. Um, why, uh, why children's books? The story, the story that my publicist likes to give is that, um, that I had kids and started writing for kids, but that's actually not true. Um, the, the deep, dark secret is that the entire time I was doing my MFA and the entire time I was going to college in Chattanooga doing my undergrad, I was secretly running off to the children's library to read. I really like kids' books. I think that um, for a lot of writers, there are these ideas about like what's art and like what's good and what's serious. And I think when you write for children and when you read for children, there's a lot less of that. So there are some very commercial, very sort of pulpy kinds of children's books that are really creative and interesting and innovative and weird. I mean, weird stuff. Like, there's, there's a friend of mine's working on a com very commercial series right now that's like all about these little <laughs> flying colored horses that like zoom around the world and have magic powers. Like, you can't do that in an adult book. <laughs> you certainly can't do that in an adult book unless it's very serious and experimental and like magic realism and stuff like that. So, um, so I think for me it was that, that I was interested in magic and sort of surreality and, and weird stuff. And in children's books, you can do anything you want. And I think it took me a long time to get over the, the sort of the genre divide, that people don't treat children's books as literature most of the time in the same way. Um, but once I had sort of, once the dam broke, it was over. I feel like there's a lot of a relationship between poetry and children's books that there isn't as much with adult literature, with adult prose. Did, did I understand you to say that you were embarrassed for anyone to know that you were writing? At, at the time, yeah. It, I, went through a undergrad, I went through a graduate program that was very, very fiercely competitive and very, um, there were a lot of sort of in-group fighting about aesthetics. And so it's like, you know, it's like people were fighting about like whether John Ashbery's middle work or early work was more important. And here's me and I'm like, I'm reading Little Women, you know, like I just... <laughs> I didn't feel like it was a part of the theory conversation. Um, and uh, in retrospect, it was all worthwhile, and it was all useful, and it was all worth learning, as most things are. 
but um, but I should have owned it sooner. I think I think that's a lesson for everybody <laughs> that when you feel something strongly enough to be spending your afternoons anywhere, sort of diligently reading, it's probably a good thing, not a bad thing. Uh, a long search and a lot of rejection. Um, one of the things that I do when I go visit children's programs is I bring my rejection letters with me and I show them rejection letters and then I show them the rejection letter from Random House for this book that I ignored and resubmitted the book for. Um, there are a lot of websites that can help you with that kind of stuff. The poetry, the poetry game is very different than, than more commercial publishing. Um, poetry books typically, a first book will come out through a contest. Um, or a small university press or something like that. But with, with children's books, unlike with adult prose writing, if you actually want to write children's books, you don't need an agent and you don't need to go through contests. You can just write a book and send it. And nowadays you can even email it. So if you go online, there are all these websites that can tell you all of these different editors at various, I mean, at Random House and Simon and & Schuster and HarperCollins who will take an unagented manuscript for a writer. Um, so it's it's... It's daunting. I mean, I think I started, as I said, in 2000. The book came out in 2008. <laughs> um, and it went through like four revised drafts. And so it, there was a lot of work involved. But I do think that it's a waiting game, that it's a sort of, if you keep working at it and listening to other people and respecting the input you're getting, um, I think if you're not dumb, I mean, which you know, some of us are, I guess, sometimes. But, uh, but if, you, if you have something decent, you'll eventually get it there. Yeah, I think that there are two. I think there are a couple of things that are happening. One of them is, in the, I mean, specifically this year, as opposed to any other time, something strange has happened, which is that, um, from a business standpoint, the children's publishing marketplace is very different than the adult. In that, people, when you buy a hardback book for yourself at the library on your way on a plane, you think of it as a luxury item. It's like you spend twenty bucks on a book you're going to read once. When you buy a children's book, you think of it as an educational tool. So it, the children's market isn't seeing the same plummet that the adult market has seen. Um, so I think that's part of it. It's just that a lot of publishers, a friend of mine who's an adult novelist who has a big book coming out from a big house, his publisher asked him recently if he would be interested in writing children's books. There's some, there's some of that stabilizing the economy. Um, but the other piece is just that it's, it's wild stuff. Interesting, in, a lot of my poetry friends are starting to work in, I mean, just now starting to work in children's work. Um, I think that, I think that Books like Harry Potter, I mean, the, sort of these books came and kind of broke it open and made room for some weird stuff. And there are some weird picture books coming out of some really big houses now, which is awesome. I'm incredibly happy about that. And I, I hope it continues and happens more and more. Um, I would like to see as many diverse ways of doing this as possible. Did you see yourself uh, actually getting anything, before you got anything published, did you actually see yourself uh, doing the children's books versus, uh, you know, adult literature? Um, I think I thought I was an academic and that I was going to pursue a teaching career and that I was going to publish poetry sort of slowly as a teaching career. I mean, teaching doesn't leave a lot of room for a lot of other stuff. Um, because I had children, I stepped back from that world and because I can write at home and work on children's books at home, I think that's the way in which having kids has affected my career is that I can write at home, I can't teach at home, and so I'm writing more for children right now. How that will change when my kids go to kindergarten, I couldn't guess. <laughs> um, but I mean, I don't think when I started writing them, I thought they would necessarily get published. I think I always assumed that if I worked hard enough, eventually I would have some kind of an academic career. Um, but I certainly wouldn't have expected that the children's work would become more lucrative than the other stuff. Um, what kind of children's books do you like? and? What do you think adults can get from children's books? <clears throat> my two favorite books that came out this year are a book by a woman called Polly Horvath um, called My 100 Adventures and a book by a woman named Victoria Forrester. It was actually her first book called The Girl Who Could Fly. Um, I like books that are magical but not fantasy. I'm not, I'm not really, I mean, there, there are lots of well-written fantasy books. I'm not really into Wizards and Dragons, but I like when the world isn't as our world is. I like when the rules of the world are a little off kilter. And that's something that I think runs through my poetry and my, my uh, children's work. Um, that sort of, like the gravity is altered somehow in those worlds. Um, I, I, most of all, I reread classics. I love Edward Eager and Roald Dahl and sort of a lot of the mid-century 
kind of writers. Um, I just wrote the introduction for a new issue of E. Nesbitt's book, Five Children and It. Um, that kind of sort of early magical stuff. Um, and what was the other part of the question? What, uh, what do you think adults can get out of children? Oh, um, I think that, I mean, in my ideal world, not all children's books, like not all adult books, are what I would call literature. Um, I think literature implies a certain care and language, a certain sense of craft, um, a certain sense of a sort of innovation um, or of conversation with a canon, a classical tradition. Um, I think that a lot of children's books and a lot of adult books don't do that. But I, I, in my world, I wish that people would just read for the story. I mean, or the language. You know, that I wish, I wish there didn't have to be these genre distinctions. I, like the the sort of the two books I read this week were a book called the um, what's it called the Giraffe, the Pelly, and Me, which is one of the later Roald Dahl books, and a book called American Rust by a, it's a new novelist named Philip Meyer. Um, the books couldn't have had. I mean. The, the, the adult novel was about two guys in like Rust Belt, Pennsylvania who like kill a guy and end up in, in the prison system. And The Giraffe, the Pelly and Me is about a, a, a ladderless window cleaning company who like ends up moving into a mansion. You know, like I read, for, I read for something to be an excellent example of whatever it is that it is. And I would like to think that adults would do the same with children's books. Pretty much like that. I carry it because of the kids now. I carry a tape recorder in my car. <laughs> what? Oh, are you the crazy Thank teacher? You. Thank you. <laughs> I I actually do a lot of my writing in the grocery store parking lot now, and I tell this to people, and they, they think I'm joking, but I'm totally serious because the kids will fall asleep if the heat's on and they're tired. The kids will fall asleep in the back of the car in their car seats, and then I just stop wherever I am, and I get out my notepad and my. I mean, I just time is a huge commodity for me right now, so. Um, so I, I like sit there and talk into my, but I mean, I'll be like at a traffic light and something will pop in my head and I'll be like in my dad's, you know, police is one of these days the police are going to pull me over and be like, what are you doing all driving all crazy? And I'm going to be like, I'm working on a Sestina. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think that, yeah, I, I'm not a big believer in like you have to wait for the muse or anything like that. I think that writing is a lot of hard work, but in those moments when you have a thought, it's like anything else. Like if you suddenly, if, if you look at, suddenly occurred to you a, a great theme for a birthday party, or it suddenly occurred to you like, I don't know what you guys do, like what you want to put in this flower bed, or how to make your biscuits better, or whatever it is that you like to do, you have to make a note to yourself or you'll forget it. Life's too busy. So yeah, I mean, I do think that. I do think that you, you sort of take the ideas when they come and you be thankful for them, and then you do them the honor of working really hard at making them as good as they can be. And if you don't have time, then you forgive yourself because you can't always. And you're not going to write every poem you were meant to write or that you could possibly write. Or story or essay or whatever. Anyone else? Did you um, do your own illustrations? Or did you work with an illustrator? I can't draw. I wish I could, but I... Um, you know, when you're a kid, you draw people with their hands behind their backs because it's really hard to draw fingers. I still do that. Like, I can't draw. Um, <laughs> I'm very lucky in that I have an agent who has tried to write some creative control into my books for me so that I have some amount of, if not veto power at least, I think they call it like meaningful conversation, like that they have to engage me in meaningful conversation before they make decisions. Um, it, but for the most part books happen by, there's text and then they find an illustrator that matches that text and I think for the editors it's really important to um, to leave them that amount of control because that's a big part of their marketing, that's a big part of their creative process. But what's interesting that I hadn't thought to say is that the illustrator who was assigned to me for this book, Jamie Zollers, who at the time was in Los Angeles but then moved to Baltimore, which is where I'm from, so I actually do get together with her when I go home, um, who did a beautiful job, I then went to and said, will you do the cover of my book of poems? So she actually read my poems and then paint their, drew or painted or whatever this is. Um, for the book to go with the poems. Um, I, don't know, I don't know anybody else who ever had work commissioned to match their poetry, but because I'm more used to working with an illustrator, and what I'd like to do someday with a book of poems is I want to do a, po a book of poems that is a flip book at the bottom, 
that is in some way connected to the text of the poetry, so that like if you go like this, you see like in this book it might be like a little girl falling through the air or something like that. Um, I, I love. I mean, I just like artistic collaboration. I'd love to do. I'd love to do songwriter collaborations. And I'd sort of. I don't see any reason why you should limit the influences on your work. So. Nobody's told me I can't, so I'm not gonna stop. <laughs> mm -hmm. I always like to ask um, artists this. That you know, when you like for, for writers, it's mostly with like um, with like readings and, and that sort of thing. But have you ever had like a really bad reading or a really bad experience with like with well, other people and putting it out there? It's how, we were talking right before the reading about this. I think I do radio work too. I do sound work, um, and I think that's been helpful to me in helping me break out of poetry voice. You know, like I could do, <clears throat> pick a random poem. When my tea gets cold, I like to cry, and there's a run in my stockings that won't ever end. It gets me, but isn't it endearing? Tell me I'm endearing in a straight back chair. You know, like, there's like, I don't know where people learn that, but, um, but we all do. I mean, I did, and then at some point, I think the radio stuff helped, like, having somebody there, like, flogging you. That's like a pay gig going, like, no, you got to punch it, you know, so you got to, people have to understand what you're saying. Um, was helpful to me in changing the way that, whether it's for the good or the bad, I don't know. But it, I do read differently than I used to. Um, I think that we owe it to people who come and sit in chairs for whatever reason, whether they're getting credit or not. Um, we owe it to people to perform. And what we do on the page is for ourselves. And what we do in a room is for the people who did us the honor of coming and listening to us. Um, so I try really, really hard to engage. It doesn't always work. I, I actually did a reading not too long ago in Decatur where I tried a bunch of new poems that I'm working on that are these very small poems that are all little dictionary poems. They're all like essentially what I imagine my young child thinks when he sees these objects and it just didn't work. Like they were too short, they were too small and sort of people were sort of generously nodding and smiling but you can tell like they're not really <laughs> listening. Um, and then if you're smart you pay attention and you stop doing those and move to something else very quickly. But some people practice really hard, and they come with a set program, and they have a hard time. It's like a set list if you're in a band. Like, they have a hard time leaving their list, so I don't know. But yeah, I mean, everybody's bombed. So you, you consider like this a performance? Mm -hmm. I mean, you're people sitting in front of me, and I'm supposed to in some way engage, entertain, or educate you, or something, you know? Like, I would like to think that that's what's going to happen. Um, at the very least, I hope nobody falls asleep. But sometimes, I mean, I've fallen asleep in reading. Everybody does sometimes fall asleep in class. So and it doesn't mean it's not a good teacher when that happens. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I've wanted to be a professional writer since I was in the fourth grade. This is all I've ever wanted to do. I mean, I, that's not true. I wanted to be a ballerina, and I wanted to be an actress on movies. I mean, like, I had dreams, but the only thing that I've ever really worked at consistently and have done so all my life. I, if you were to come out to my car with me, I take with me to visit children um, the first book I ever made. It's like a piece of cardboard that I scribbled these little poems on when I was in, like, fourth grade that I take and show them because the point is, like, I have been working on this for decades now. Um, it doesn't happen overnight, but... Uh, I mean, I think for most people, there's, I think a lot of people can remember a book that touched them, a book that made them go, like, I want to do that. Um, but for me, those were really, maybe that's why I write for children. It's because I started wanting to do this when I was very young. So I read, no, but I did. I read Yeats and Blake. And I mean, my dad read me a lot of traditional poetry when, I mean, you know, serious poetry when I was a kid. But I didn't, in the fourth grade, distinguish between Blake and Yeats and Tea and Jam for Francis. Like, I didn't know... Like, they were just the things I read, so. I don't know. Anyway. All right, well, um, Sid, no more questions? Well, thank you, Laurel. Thank you so much, everyone. <laughs>